This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Are you always tired? Well, today's guest may have the answer you've been looking for. Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith was like most people in the medical field, exhausted. And like most of us, thought all she needed was more sleep. When that didn't work, she began researching rest from both a biblical and a scientific perspective, and the result was this book. Today, she'll give us an insight into the seven types of rest we need to have. Dr. Smith joins us via Skype from her home in Birmingham, Alabama. We just think, well, I, I'm gonna, I just need more sleep. I, if I could just get a few hours sleep or a few hours here, steal a nap there, wouldn't that do it for you? Well, that's what I thought. So when I first had that experience, I thought, well, maybe this is just, I'm physically exhausted. I just need to get more sleep or physically. my sleep quality is mm -hmm. not enough. And so that's where I started. I started with, well, I got to be honest. I started with ordering a bunch of tests on myself. <laughs> Same thing I would <laughs> with any patient. Any, any patient, yeah. <laughs> like make sure it's not my thyroid, my adrenals or anything else that I can blame on mm -hmm. why I'm tired all the time. And when all of that came back negative, I thought, okay, I'm only getting at the time about six hours of sleep. And so I added mm -hmm. another few to get up to eight. And did you still get up tired? Yes. <laughs> I was still getting up exhausted and it didn't work. And that's when it really started feeling discouraging. It was like, okay, I'm getting eight to nine hours of sleep and I'm still tired. So is there just no hope? Is this just the normal way of living? Is that why everybody's so tired all the time? It's, it's not sleep, is it? Because if sleep was the only reason I was tired, then when I got adequate sleep, then I should feel restored. And I wasn't. And so that's when it, I started kind of diving into what does the research say? What does scripture say? I don't believe that scripture and science are kind of mutually exclusive from each other. I feel like they actually work together for a, a more total picture. And so I was looking at both and started trying to find out where, what type of rest is it or what kind of tired is it that I really am? What type of rest is it that I need? Because it was something more than physical. Early in, a lot of people out of college think this is this is it. I'm I'm a Type A personality. This is my life. I'm gonna I'm gonna live it and love it. Yes, that's how I started. I that's my personality. I'm the type that if there's work, let's do it. Let's stop whining about it. <laughs> let's just get it done. But that's the thing. I think what what's happened is we've really created a culture where when people do get burned out, they almost feel as if there's no hope because this is just as good as it gets. This is what life looks like in this day and age. And it's not biblical. That's not a biblical sense of, the, of an abundant life. An abundant life isn't depleted. It isn't working out of your, your exhaustion. And so I think that's part of what really had me thinking there's something out of, out of really alignment with what God's plans are for how we are to work and rest. Well, if, if sleep really isn't, I mean, it's, it's a type of rest, it's a physical rest, uh, did you find anything else in, in, uh, in the journals or in the research that you did that said there, there are other types of rest, or was this, typical, was this uh, totally a, a biblical re revelation? Well, the first thing that I started to find were that many people were talking about three types of rest specifically. They were talking about the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. And so mm -hmm. I do believe in the mind, the body, and the spirit, and how all three work together. So that's where I first started my research on rest. But even as I started looking at that, and then started looking at just some examples in the Bible, specifically going through the life of Jesus, because I feel like in, in those kind of three years of ministry, he did a whole mm -hmm. lot to stay well rested still. So I wanted some examples of what does that look like to live out a well rested life. And that's when the seven types of rest kind of unfolded because there were types of rest and types of restoration that I saw that I hadn't seen really discussed anywhere else. Yeah. When you, when you look at, it, at some of those seven types, though, and we think of rest, okay, I'm going to take a vacation, I'm going to get a massage, I'm going to do this, I'm going to restore myself physically. What are some of the things that people have, you've seen people use to replace rest, some of the things that we grab a hold of and say, I'll feel better after I do this. Yes, I think vacations are number one. People think I'm tired, I just need to take a vacation, but, and I've done that. But I mean, let's be honest, when we go on vacation, really we just go do fun stuff away from home. And so it's not relaxing, it's not restorative. 
for many of us, vacations are exhausting. And I have two boys who are extremely active. So when we go on vacation, it's like bumper cars and, you know, yeah, it's activity the whole time. And so I don't get back home any more rested. I actually come home more exhausted than when I went on the vacation. Multitasking is another one. People think, well, if I maybe I can get more work done by just doing four things at one time. I'll check my email and I'll do this and this all at the same time. And really all it does is lead to, to greater sensory overload, greater sensory rest deficits and, and greater mental rest deficits because we're just exhausting those um, areas faster because we're consuming it so quickly. Well, we think like we're, we're, we're going to create more time. We've, we're going to end up with more than 24 hours in this day because they're going to do three things at once. Right. And, <laughs> and you don't really end up with any more. Well, throughout the book, you use the, the, an acronym REST, R-E-S-T. Uh, go through that and tell me what that means as you're trying to diagnose uh, when you're taking a look at our lives and what we need to do. Well, the first part is recognizing your current risk. And that's really looking at what your lifestyle looks like. Do you use a lot of mental energy or a lot of creative energy? Are you expending your time mostly physically? Because once you evaluate kind of what your normal day-to-day -day looks like, it starts helping you see which of the seven types of rest that you're most likely to become deficient in. And then the E is evaluate your current position. And so if you already feel tired in one of these areas, you really have to kind of determine what level of fatigue you are, which of these has the greatest rest deficit? Because it, it can seem almost overwhelming to think, oh my yeah. goodness, there's seven of them. But usually <laughs> there's all. only, yeah, <laughs> you feel like I just got to get them all. But usually there's only one or two that you really are, need to focus on because those are the places of your greatest rest deficit. The other ones, you're probably already doing some things automatically without even really thinking about it. You've just kind of learned some habits that are restorative, that keep those areas healthy. And then the S deals with the science and the research, really. It's the part seven where you just have to get an understanding. I think as a physician, I find that it's much easier to discuss someone's diabetes or high blood pressure with them when they know a little bit about the science. They don't have to get a degree, but they do have to have an understanding of it sure. just to be able to kind of know how things work so that they can continue mm -hmm. on the process. And then T is today's application. It's just the practical things that you can do to actually mm -hmm. put it into practice in your own life. Yeah. What were some of the things, some of the complaints that uh, patients were presenting when they came into your office that you begin to think, this is, a, this is caused by a, uh, a rest deficit. This is caused by, there, there's something in their life that they're, they're not rejuvenating. Uh, after you did the internal medicine overlook, uh, what were some of the complaints that people had that you, you said, this is, this is coming from a lack of rest? Well, one of the biggies was insomnia. So many people were saying, I can't sleep. I lay down at night and my head's racing and I can't get my brain to turn off. Can you give me something to knock me out? And when I hear <laughs> that, I'm thinking... I don't, yeah. you know, we shouldn't have to knock you out to go to sleep. The brain should be able to get to a quiet place, you know, and go and go, drift off into deeper levels of sleep. And that was one of the huge things, because that's really a sign of a mental rest deficit. Your mind won't won't get to that quiet place. It's constantly mm -hmm. trying to process and filter information. Well, if it's not just going to sleep or taking a nap. It's not just the cessation of activity. You're talking about some things that we need to feed into our lives, some things mm -hmm. that uh, are deficits so that need to be refueled. First, let's, let's talk about the seven, the seven rest deficit. What, what are we talking about? We, I mean, we know there's physical. We know we, we get physically tired and mentally. I mean, a lot of people don't understand that. What are some of those mm -hmm. other rest that we need? The other one that, that's very common that people at least have heard of oftentimes is spiritual. Mm -hmm. And then the four that came out of the research that were lesser known, but are the ones that many people have been experiencing are emotional, social, sensory, and creative. Wow, that, that is, that, that, when, you, when you take a look at this, sensory, I mean, we think it, uh, we're, we're wearing ourselves out looking at computer screens and mm -hmm. keeping up Absolutely. on social media, and, and every time the phone rings, I've got to check and see what kind of mail I've got. The kids are on the games all the time. That, I think a lot of people will, will begin to understand that that, that is uh, an issue with, with sensory deprivation or sensory overload, we can, mm -hmm. how does that play out in our life and how do we, how, how would we see that? Uh, you've got a test in the back of the book. 
uh, give us a couple yeah. examples of, of how we know if, if it's spiritual, if it's sensory, if it's creativity. Give us a few examples of that, of that quiz that, that people can take online, right? Yes, the quiz is available in the book as well, uh, and it's available at my website at restquiz.com. But just, to, I guess, a quick example of sensory rest specifically, because that's one that I think many people are experiencing and don't really know why they're feeling the way mm -hmm. they're feeling. Um, if you think about well, like a two-year-old at a birthday party, you know, they start off, they're happy, they're having a great time, about an hour into it, no one's <laughs> taken their toy, no one's took their cake, they're just screaming their head off. They've had a sensory overload episode. You add 16 years to that, you've got a teenager who's sitting down with a video game, playing it for eight to 10 hours at a time in the summer, and you wonder why they're rebellious and they are talking back and they're combative. Mm -hmm. All of that can be related to a sensory rest overload. And then you take that same person and you add another 20 or so years to them and they're coming out, you know, they're at their office, they're in front of a computer most of the day, answering phones, checking emails, checking um faxes, all of those things. And then when they come home after work, they're irritable. They're unable to have, you know, conversation with their families because they're just kind of overly wound up. All of those can be a sign of a sensory rest overload. Unfortunately, our, our current environment has a lot of us working from home and doing things on the computer yeah. that we maybe didn't do in the past. And sure. so now it's even more important to just be aware of how that sensory rest deficit and the sensory overload can make can really affect our ability to have good communication, to be patient, um, to be able to continue to feel less anxious and less stressed. How about another another one? Or something like uh, creative or spiritual? How would you recognize that in somebody? Yes, well, creative rest deficits, people who have those have a tendency to feel unmotivated. They feel as if they have a difficult time uh, brainstorming and coming up with new ideas. Because cr creative rest is, it's the rest that we experience when we allow ourselves to, to really just have that awe and wonder that comes from yeah. appreciating beauty. Whether that's natural beauty, many people experience it at the ocean or around bodies of water. That's the most common type of creative rest that people um, tend to experience that feeling with. Mm -hmm. Some get it when they're um, around like music or they're hearing certain music or even at art, um, looking at art or going to an art museum. Mm -hmm. A lot of us do experience that um, kind of awe and wonder in different ways. But what it does is it allows us to be able to get back to a place where we feel motivated, where we feel inspired, mm -hmm. where we see, where we really see ourselves as someone who can become more innovative because we've allowed that time in our lives. Right. How do we begin to treat something like that? I mean, you just get away and get to a quiet place, get to a place that, that uh, inspires you creatively? I mean, like you yeah, said, go, so, to, you a, know, go to a beach or a, a lake or a waterfall or something? If you have the, uh, the access to that, that's great. Mm -hmm. But many of us don't live anywhere near water. <laughs> right. So we I don't live in Hawaii. Yeah. No. So I love that the research showed that people who have that response actually can experience that same feeling just by looking at images of it. Mm -hmm. They did a study where they checked the brain MRIs of people who were who experienced creative rest through the ocean. And they showed them images of colors that were teals and blues, colors of the water. It wasn't even the water. And the same response happened in the brain. So I think that's very encouraging for us, for some of us who don't live anywhere mm -hmm. near our places of creative rest. Change your lock screen on your phone. Put a, um, wall, the wallpaper on your computer to be something that inspires you. That way, if, at least when, it, when you have to be in front of those settings, that there is some benefit that's happening there as well. If you're in um, many workplaces now, you'll notice have taken up this um, really new idea of not having these brown and gray walls like mm -hmm. we used to have. And they're using some more lively colors for that reason, because of the science behind really having an inspirational setting where you have to do your work. We'll pick up our discussion with Dr. Smith in a moment on the remaining types of rest. We'll also discuss the impact of the pandemic and how social media is adding to your lack of rest. If you enjoy these interviews, I encourage you to check out our videos on YouTube, as well as all the audio from our shows on our podcast. Just search for Viewpoint with Bob Placey on your favorite podcast app, such as Apple Podcasts or Spotify, and you can listen on demand. 
As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. How do I know if I got a spiritual deficit? I mean, you think, well, especially when you get a, a say that someone's a pastor or someone's involved in ministry and that's their whole life, how could they possibly have a spiritual deficit? That's very interesting. I, I speak to a lot of, of pastor groups um, and m people who are ministers and in leadership and ministry. And it's interesting, uh, quite a few of them, this is the area that they mm -hmm. tend to say they have a rest deficit. And the reason being is because sometimes it's when you spend a lot of time in God's word and you're constantly studying it, constantly have it on your mind, you don't sometimes think about the relationship portion of that. And that is what spiritual rest is. It's not the, the studying of the word. It's mm -hmm. the relationship with the father. It's having that that intimacy, that kind of abiding presence of God that you are really aware of and to just make sure that you stay aware of it. And so if you ever start feeling like you're working for God, instead of kind of ha having a relationship with him, mm -hmm. that's when you start noticing there's a little bit of something happening there with the spiritual rest component, because that spiritual rest part is really more about relationship and intimacy and just time in his presence, not asking for an answer, not seeking out a word for your church, not you know doing anything that specifically is educational it's more relational. You tell somebody this and they think, well, it's going to take more time. I need more time. It's going to, it's, I, I, I can't, don't have the time to really rest. What would you tell them? Well, that's the thing. These are not activities that are going to take like extended periods mm -hmm. of time. We're basically trying to live a lifestyle of rest. So Continue. you incorporate it within your day, act, mm -hmm. daily day activities. And so that's why I love things like being able to change your lock screen to something that adds creative rest. Put fresh flowers in your house. If you're someone who the outdoors is a creative rest app, you know, part of your creative rest experience. If you're someone who feels like you're getting away from God, you're more working for him than having a relationship with him. Then part of that devotional time, rather than spending it in the word, spend time in the Word, but also leave time just to listen, just to sit, just to be in His presence, just to have that quiet moment. And so it's not adding to it, it's adjusting uh, some of the ways we're already trying to rest that aren't effective. I find so many people that'll, that'll tell me, rest doesn't work for me. But what they mean by rest is they're laying on the sofa on Saturday with Netflix playing for like three hours, you know, back to back of a show, and they think that just by changing the activity to something different, that it's rest. And really, rest has to be restorative for it to feel restful. It has to restore the places where you're actually depleting yourself. Well, that, that's interesting because you mentioned in there the people that would say, well, I'll just do a sleep marathon on the weekend. If it's, I'm physically exhausted, I've worked hard all week, I'm going to do a sleep marathon, I'm going to, I'm going to sleep in until 10 o'clock, I'm going to take a nap in the afternoon. That's really counterproductive, isn't it, according to your book? Absolutely. What, Absolutely. what does that actually do to, do, do to us physically? What does it do to us when we, when we oversleep? Most of us, when we oversleep, we actually wake up feel, feeling more tired because what ends up happening is if you already have a physical rest deficit that's related to your your, your how frequently you're active, mm -hmm. um, you know, a large part of the world's very inactive. And so if that's part of the issue, because physical rest does have two components, the, uh, or um, it has the active and the passive. Mm -hmm. So that's physical, has two components. And so if your issue is with the, active part of physical rest, meaning your circulation's not good, your lymphatics don't drain well, then just laying flat in the bed for extended periods of time 
above and beyond what you need, it's just going to exacerbate that. It's actually not going to improve it in any way whatsoever. And it's certainly not going to improve, let's say, if you have a social or an emotional rest deficit. Lying in bed is not going to touch those areas at all. Mm -hmm. well, uh, let's get specifically here. You had mentioned earlier about uh, we've had the pandemic. I mean, 2020 was not the greatest year in the world. And in, in, in our history, anyway, there's a lot of things going on, but uh, and, and it did throw a lot of throw a curve into a lot of people's lives. I mean, the kids were home from school, uh, the kids were working from school or from home. Uh, parents, maybe both parents, working at, at at home. How do you think that's impacted uh, one mental health, and and two the ability for people to actually get rest? And did it change? Uh, what would have been their normal rest deficit? Did it go from one thing to another because they were all together at home for a while? There is a study that was done the middle of March through the middle of April that um, specifically asked people, do they feel like the pandemic and being locked in affected their ability to sleep? And over 78% of the Americans that were interviewed said yes. 78 wow. percent. That's 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 a ridiculous that's a big number. Of people. Yes, it that's is. That's a lot of people who feel like that episode of time really affected their ability to sleep. And then they also asked that same group, do you feel like you are more anxious during this time? Do you feel like it's affected you mentally? And 48 percent of them said yes to that as well. So I definitely feel like it has affected us mentally. Then we had so many people who went from situations where their life was very well segmented. They went sure. to work, they went to school, they went home. So mm -hmm. they, everything was in its nice little bucket. And then the kids were home with you and you still had to work and then you still had to feed everybody when you never had to cook three meals sure. before because they were gone. Yep. So it was an excessive amount of change that happened kind of all at the same time. And the, the, the numbers changed. I had many people who took the rest quiz at that time. And in the past, it has always been that mental rest was always very high and emotional rest was very high. Well, emotional rest stayed high and, so, and sensory rest skyrocketed. Wow. Skyrocketed. <laughs> yeah. Too and, much time before think, the TV. <laughs> yes. The TV internet everybody wanted to keep up with what the virus sure. was doing next and you know what is everyone saying we should be doing and then everyone's work even meta even physicians i mean we'd always had our work you know computerized electronic medical records but then you had to see patients on the computer too <laughs> so there i don't think any profession didn't have a kind of a complete unraveling of that their time because yeah. everything shifted to the virtual mm -hmm. space speaking everything everything went virtual mm -hmm. and so sensory went through the roof because most of us have never thought about sensory overload yeah. it's never crossed our mind <laughs> that it's even an issue because it's just how we live we live with our electronics all the time as part of our lives but some of the most recent studies that have been showing is that you know before your you would have your phone on, but you didn't really have access to it all day. Mm -hmm. Now you really do have access to it all day. And for many people, they have their notifications set very high. So every time someone texts them or emails them, they get, or even Good. social media. Yeah, the, the phone goes off and automatically you want to check and see what's happening. And the, the strange thing is, you know, when I was in medical school and first got started, I was so excited to get my pager. It's like, I'm a real doctor. I've got a pager. <laughs> And, you know, every time that pager went off, I would jump and, and my heart rate would go up. I, my palms would hit sweaty because I knew if that pager was going off, something bad was happening somewhere. Mm. Well, that's the thing. Most of us, our body's response is a low level of the same thing every time our phone notifications go off. Fight or flight. Yes. Yeah. It's like someone needs me. And so we pick it up. And the problem is. Many of the notifications now are not things that people need you. It's nope. someone letting you know they had a, you know, they had a great coffee somewhere or, you know, or that their grandchild just did something. So you get these notifications about things that are not things you really have to know in the moment, but your response is still the right. same. Our producer upstairs just let me know that he took the quiz while we were, ta while we were talking oh, here. Wow. <laughs> and uh, it was, I think it's like five out of the seven he was over 26 on. Is he should, should, should he just quit and go to raising chickens? Or should, <laughs> he, he's Start aware. with the highest one. <laughs>
Start with the highest one and work on that one first. That's exactly right. I always recommend people start with the highest one because honestly, because I did the same thing. I was like, what would my score mm-hmm. have been if I took it when I was on the floor? Every right. number would have been in the 30s or higher. Yeah. Because yeah. I was I was burned out. I just I had no motivation. I had no energy. Everything everything was at the bottom of what I could what I where I could be. And so I totally get it. But you don't start trying to fix all five because otherwise that'll just be too Burn overwhelming. Out. Yeah, just pick the first, the, the highest one and start there. And what I find is that when people start focusing on the one that's their highest rest deficit, they automatically start feeling better because one of the places of depletion is getting poured back into. And so you don't feel so tired all the time. So then once you, you're like, okay, well, doing this one thing seemed to help. Let me add another yeah, one thing that one I more. can can do because it's not really huge changes they're oftentimes Mm -hmm. small changes sometimes something as simple as time blocking like for people who do a lot of emails if you check your email kind of throughout the day emails can be a little bit stressful just the managing of them and so time blocking where you do it maybe at a set amount of time in the morning and then you check it again at a set amount of time in the afternoon and then you don't check it again till the next morning or however your schedule has Mm -hmm. to be for that to be you know appropriate but by doing that and not doing it all day long, the entire eight hours that you're at work <laughs> yep. actually helps maintain your your ability to feel restored because you're not pouring out into that area the entire day. Yeah, the, the, and we get into the, the third or the, actually the second section of your book, the gifts the gifts of, of, of rest. And one of mine, I want you to just address real quickly here is the sacred rest of boundaries, uh, uh, the gift of boundaries. Uh, there's so much in here; it's so rich. But uh, give me a, a, a snippet of, of those gifts and especially the one on boundaries. Well, I think boundaries is probably one of the most important ones. Mm-hmm. I started with it. And I think it's the reason that many of us burn out. Yeah. Um, a lot of us have people pleasing type behaviors and personalities, particularly people I find who who are believers. We want to help people. We mm-hmm. are ser- we have a servant's heart. But having a servant's heart does not mean not using judgment <laughs> and not being mindful of what is your work to do and what is not your work to do. And I think we have to just be really aware of that. I find that sometimes we, we will say yes to things that we really should be saying no to, that we don't have the heart for, we really don't, you know, are, aren't in a good spirit to even do, but we don't want to hurt someone's feelings. It's much better to give a truthful no than a reluctant yes. Dr. Smith's book is available online and in many Christian bookstores. You can also take her rest quiz at restquiz.com. If you like this program, you'll notice we have no advertising. We're totally supported by the generous gifts of viewers like you. So if you can, please go to WTLW.com and help support this program today. And thanks for watching. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.